I, I keep reminding myself as I was singing that I was loving my neighbors by having it on because I needed some positive motivation as I was sucking my mask into my throat uh, while I was breathing there. Uh, but I'm so grateful to be with you today. I just want to pray as we get underway. Uh, and so, yes, so to take that, I do look different today. Uh, so some people are looking, what happened to that man? Well, I just sh- shaved off my goatee today. Uh, one of my, I, I've texted a picture to my family on our family text, and one of my sons-in-law has never seen me, and none of them have seen me without facial hair. And his response was, wow. So I don't know how to read that uh, in terms of whether that's like, ba- wow, that's really bad, or wow, would you please grow that back, or what would you do? Uh, but I think it's been over a decade uh, that this, uh, my face has been covered by some sort of facial hair. So a new look for me, and uh, this morning, hopefully not too startling, but I am the same person. Nothing's happened internally. I just cut some hair off of my face. All right, well, let's pray together today. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, uh, Lord, for your goodness to us. Lord, you are so good. And Lord, we, we struggle, uh, Lord, to get inside of just how good you are. Lord, we have way too high estimations of ourselves. And we have way too low estimations of the depth of sin and its penetration into our lives. And so, Lord, when we hear about the precious blood of Christ, we hear about uh, a death on a cross, uh, we talk about the resurrection from a tomb and the coming Christ. Lord, we, we struggle, Lord, to get inside of what it means that you have set your affection on us, on us. And so, Lord, we pray. Lord, take the truths that we prayed together, that we celebrated. Lord, I I pray by your spirit, Lord, you would give us uh, eyes to see. Lord, the eyes of our heart would be open to the height and width and length and breadth of your love for us. Lord, may it just overwhelm us. May it it tether our hearts to you. May it make our obedience something that's joyful and full of trust and expectation. And so, Lord, thank you. Thank you for song. Thank you for gathering together as the body of Christ. Thank you for all the things you give us. And we just commit our service to you today. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, let me uh, put something here. I don't think we've mentioned it here. Uh, Many of you, have you seen these in your bulletin? Okay, if you're new here this week, it may be the first time you've seen these. Uh, We just put these in the bulletin. Uh, Will Urschel uh, did all these and put them in here. And basically, this is just to help us orient toward each other, especially after the service. When we fellowship together, it kind of gives your comfort level in terms of physical contact or physical presence with other people, right? Uh, It's pretty obvious if you think about it. Green means that I'm I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with you coming up close to me and having a handshake or whatever, an elbow bump or whatever it is wants to be. Caution is maybe we'll keep the distancing. Red, I'm pretty uh, concerned about the impact of COVID and things like this. And again, there's no judgment on any color. You can have any color you want, and that's okay. And we respect that. And it just helps people, instead of you having to ask a person each time uh, what they're comfortable with, if you put the color on, a person knows that you're just comfortable with that. And so for me, right, I would put the, I'd pick the green one out, which I can't seem to get off right now. Uh, I'd get the green one on and put it here uh, so that somebody can know that one, right? I told Rana that these were only meant for our, our time at church. She can't, you know, when I want to kiss her, she can't put the red one on at home. So I just, I just told her that uh, in case you get any other ideas how you want to use those. All right, well, I want to draw our attention to uh, uh, communion. And uh, I want some help from the kids who are here. If you know, right here on my left-hand finger, right here, I have this little ring. Does anybody know what this ring says about me? Anybody know? In the kids? What, what's it say, Freddie? I'm married. I'm married. Right? So I'm married. You know who I'm married to, Freddie? You know who it is? Who is it? Yeah, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. So this says that I'm married, and it tells everybody that I'm married. Uh, There's a story behind this with some of you if you've been here for a long time. You know that this wasn't the original ring that I had uh, when we were married, so this isn't actually the one that Rana put on my finger uh, when we were married. Uh, I was fishing uh, in a river down in Virginia, and I guess my hands got cold, and when I came out, I came out with fish, but no wedding ring. Uh, And so this one we picked up sometime later on, but it signifies that I'm married. As a matter of fact, I I do weddings very frequently, 
I was looking around to see if Mary and Nick Callis are here this morning. I didn't see them here this morning. Uh, but just most recently, Ron and I uh, performed, their, oh, performed their wedding, uh, and we did um, uh, a ring ceremony as a part of all, it's a kind of a standard piece in every uh, wedding. And it usually follows the vows. It never is the first thing, it's the thing that comes later on in the wedding. But as soon as the couple gives their vows to each other, and I always tell the couple, this is the moment where if any moment you're present, you want to be present in this moment because you're making a commitment before God that's for life. And so I want you to look into each other's eyes. I want you to say it and mean it. And I don't care what's happening if people are falling down and fainting back there. I don't care if the flowers don't look right. I don't care if somebody's behaving badly right at that moment. You need to be focused in. Don't worry about what's going to happen at the reception. Don't worry about anything else. Right now, you're going to be making a commitment that I'm going to hold you to as your brother and pastor for life. Right? I want to witness that, and I feel weighty every time I do a wedding because uh, there is a, a moment there, and God says what God joins together, and when God joins two people together, don't let people mess with it, so it's a weighty thing, and so the ring ceremony usually happens, and many of you know this, that right after they say the vows, then I'll turn to the groom, and I always start with him first, and I say, do you have a token of the sincerity of your vows? They'll respond with, I do, and then they turn over to the best man, they pluck it out, and then they stick it on the left-hand ring finger of his wife-to-be, and then I have him repeat these after me. I give you this ring as a symbol of my love and faithfulness, and with this ring, and often I'll use this old terminology, I thee wed. And what that means is I commit myself to you in accordance with the vows I just made to you. All right? So this ring is a symbol of my intention to keep the vows that I just made. And then I say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, that this is something that you are saying before God and before these witnesses, that your intention is to keep the vows that you just made to your wife or your husband. Then I'll turn to the wife and do the same thing. Now I want to dig in just for a moment to what it means when I say that this part of the ceremony, the token here, this idea of a token is not a term we use very often, or if we do use it, we use it like at fair tokens or something like that, right? But here, I want to talk about a token here. There's three things about that that it emphasizes, three things, and then we'll come back and elaborate them. First, the ring serves to represent or indicate the event of the marriage itself, okay? It indicates that the marriage happened, okay? Okay? You know, you don't go out and buy a ring and then put it on your left-hand finger and somebody says, well, hey, did you get married? And say, no, I just wanted to have a wedding ring on my hand, right? No, it indicates that something happened, right? It happened, a wedding happened. Second, it's, it's proof, it's evidence or proof that the husband and wife have a relationship with each other, right? It's evidence. If somebody wants to say, married, I can hold my hand up. And, and, and if you see young couples in particular, especially when they come to announce their engagement, uh, often they just walk up to you and don't say anything and just go like that, right? And then you go, oh, I get it. And everybody goes, oh, and then everybody cries and that kind of thing like that, right? So, but it's an evidence or proof that the relationship that the husband and wife have with each other. So it represents the event of the marriage. It represents proof of the relationship they have with each other. And then thirdly, it's a memento that you carry away from the wedding and it constantly reminds you of what that event was that initiated or started your marriage. It takes you back into that moment. So this is where you often find a pastor talk about the shape and the, the metal that, that the ring is made of, right? So often you'll hear this kind of symbolism that the ring is round and it doesn't have any end. And it's meant to symbolize that God intends this relationship to be one man for one woman for life. So it's his intention that this never ends. And so there's no, there's no break in the ring. And then the second part is that it's made out of something precious, and especially when it comes to the groom in our tradition, in our society, that he's usually outlaid a, a significant amount of money or something here to tell the woman that I consider you precious and valuable to me, and I feel the weight of my commitment to you, and I take it seriously, and I'm invested in it. So there's something precious and valuable here, and especially as a Christian, we, we, the weight of the fact that God has vested marriage with the capacity of giving a picture of what Christ does with his church and of how the church should respond to Christ, a picture of redemption and of what Christ wants to do and how he lives toward his bride. 
So those three things, it represents that the marriage has occurred, it represents evidence or proof of the marriage, and it's a memento that carries away with the husband and wife what it is that happened to them. And so this means then, when we look at the ring, though, the ring didn't make them marry, right? They were married before they put the ring on. The ring on their finger is a symbol or a token of, what, of their vows. So what does this ring say? It represents the fact that I've entered into a commitment with my wife, with Rana, that has mutually agreed privileges and responsibilities. It's a covenant. I made a covenant with my wife that I vowed, right, and, and I still use those all the time. I have couples who like to write their vows, and, and that's okay. And sometimes the couples write good vows. Most of the time, their vows are too thin, uh, and they're not kind of rooted in the kind of wisdom of the church over time. So usually I have, if they write their vows, they say their vows to each other, and then I have them repeat the traditional vows to each other. And they say weighty things, and every time I say them, I feel weighted by them. Uh, I commit myself to have and to hold, to have and to hold you until death do us part. For richer, for poor, in sickness and in health, right? whether it's happy times or sad times, I have committed myself to you, and before God, I, co I commit myself to you and you alone as long as we both shall live. Right? That's weighty. So when I, when I come to this, so it represents the fact that I've entered into this commitment. And Rana said those vows back to me. So it's a mutually agreed upon commitment. And this represents that I have made that covenant with her. And I have privileges. I have privileges with Rana that no other man has. And she has privileges with me that no other woman has. And I have responsibilities toward her that I don't have to any other woman. Right? And you hear this all the time. There's a lot of women in my life, sisters, uh, moms, uh, daughters, but there's one woman that takes priority over every other woman, right? And she sits right here. So God has made her the one that's central in my life, and she, she has that, I have a privilege and responsibility. And I specified what those privileges and responsibilities were when I made that vow. I specified it. And so then it serves as proof, right, when I remind it, there's a proof that, I, that the marriage has occurred, and then it reminds me when I pay attention to it of what I did. It reminds me of it, okay? Now, what I wanted to take here is in terms of the communion, the communion, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, the communion is a token of the sincerity of Christ's vows to his bride. Okay, I want you to think about this. The, the, the communion is a token or a symbol of the sincerity of Christ's vows to his bride. And when we take it, when we receive it, it's reminding us of the vows that we made to him. Okay? Now, let me break this down a little bit. Listen, if you have your Bibles, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to bounce around to a couple passages, but look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, a familiar passage, and this is where uh, Paul is warning the Corinthians not to get involved in feasts that involve idols. Because he's talking about what happens when Christians take communion, right? When they take the, the body and the blood of Christ, the symbols of it. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, come down to verse 16. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share in the one loaf. So taking the elements of the communion today means that we have, to use Paul's language, we've participated in Christ's death. Okay, we've participated in his death. Now let me break this out, and this is where you have some blanks to fill in some spots in your notes if you've got uh, notes there. <clears throat> okay? Now, when did this participation happen? Right? So when we're taking the communion... We're commemorating something that's already happened. Well, when did that participation happen, and what are we recalling? Well, here's what happened, right? This participation happened when we acknowledged that we were in rebellion against his loving rule in our lives. Okay, the initial step to us participating in, to benefiting from what Christ did on the cross, is we recognize that we were in rebellion against him, right? Scripture speaks about this as repentance, 
of coming to the recognition that you're not only distant from him, you're not only alienated from him, but you're separated from Christ because you have walked away from him in rebellion. So brokenness, to talk about sin as brokenness, is not really robust enough. It's not really full enough. Brokenness is the effect of what happens when you rebel against God. You get broken. Your life gets broken. Your relationships get broken. Your perspective gets broken on life and on yourself, right? That's the effect of sin. But at the core of it is when you decide that you can make it on your own apart from Christ, you can make it on your own without God's interference, well, you walk away from Him. Well, this participation in Christ started at the moment and involved the moment when you recognized that you were walking away from Him, that you were in rebellion against Him. And then second, when we ask Him to forgive our rejection of His rightful place in our lives, okay? When we ask Him to forgive that, and then our attempt to find real, or the scriptural term, eternal life, somewhere besides through him, right? So it only acknowledges that we rebelled against him and then we ask him to forgive us because in the rebellion, the idea of rebellion is that our sin isn't just against other people. It isn't just being misguided. It's just being misdirected. It's ultimately a hand in the face of God saying no. So we've offended him. That's why David, when he talks about his sin against you and you only, Psalm 51, have I sinned? So it begins with our knowledge and we're rebellion, and we ask him for forgiveness for eternal life. And then three, when we put our trust in him, accepting who he is as the Son of God and what he has done in his death and resurrection as what is necessary. So the little two terms, who he is as the Son of God and what was necessary to deliver us from sin and death. Okay. So well, we acknowledged our rebellion. We ask him to forgive us. We accepted his identity as he revealed himself. He is the Son of God. And we uh, uh, d- believe that it was absolutely necessary what he did to save me. Not something that added on to other things that I do. It's absolutely essential and the only thing that's essential for me to be saved, for me to be right. And then finally, and this is important, at that moment, we submitted to him as the supreme authority in our life. Okay? Now I want you to turn over with me, come to Romans 10 with a mi- for a moment. And any of you that have memorized what used to be called the Romans Road or you're familiar with these will know Paul's statement here, a very common one that people know. Come to Romans chapter 10. And this is what Paul says here in terms of what it is that happens, what a person believes and declares or confesses to be true uh, when they become a believer. So look in uh, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, right? To say that Jesus is Lord is to say that he was, yes, Jesus was a Jew that lived during the first century when he came in his incarnated self. Yes, that's true. But to say that Jesus is Lord is to say that he is God, that he is God of very God, that he was more than he's the God man, not that just he was a human being. And so he's not a a person who gives us a good way of life that we follow like some other uh, human counselor, right? He's not that kind of person. He's not a guy that tells us some good principles like the uh, golden rule and you follow. No, no, he is God of very God, and so our response to him is as creature to God. Right? So we accept his identity as who he is and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved, for it is with the heart that you believe and are justified. It is with the mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So to confess that he's Lord is not only confess that he's God, but it's also to orient yourself toward him as Lord, right? So there's no way that you can believe in Jesus and truly understand who he is without submitting to him as Lord. There's no way, right? You don't get to add him to your life as if he comes along and gives you fire insurance, right? He's my fire insurance provider, and I don't have to worry about hell, but as far as his place in my life, he doesn't have any place in my life. I just put him in my box with my rest of my insurance, right, materials. No, no, he comes into your life and we submit to him fully and come under his benevolent rule because he wants to bring us to life. He wants to redirect us away from the path of destruction into the path of life. Okay? So that's what happened when we participated. And then at the moment, right, that we believed in Christ, what happened then? He forgave us our sins, okay? And this is for us as Christians as we grow in Christ, This is something that is too easily lost sight of. The holy God that we have sinned against and rebelled against. 
that the only person truly to fear, the only force that truly is powerful enough that we should all fear is the God that we have sinned against. And when we believe in Christ because of what he's done, he says it's all clean. And we're going to read the passage a little bit later on. My favorite one says, God, God's on your side. If he's for you, who can be against you? And the answer is no one. As I've said many times before, but if God isn't on your side, it doesn't make any difference who is. All right? So he forgave our sins. And then secondly, by the work of the Spirit, he made you a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he made you new. He marked you out as his, uh, us as his children, right? He put his mark on us. The seal of the Holy Spirit says, she's mine, he's mine, he's mine, she's mine. They belong to me. My kids, I don't own them. So a new creation, children, and promise to complete what he had started when he saved us. The Holy Spirit is the believer in, believer's uh, down payment that, that guarantees Christ will fulfill everything that he's promised. Right? So when, when, when we believe we're forgiven and we're made a new creation, we're made his family, and he gives us a down payment and says, that what I've begun in you, I'm going to finish it. So he's assured us of his future love. One of the things by wearing this ring every day, I'm telling my wife every day, I love you. I recognize my commitment to you. I want to publicly declare it to everyone else. And it promises you ongoing faithfulness. So it promises. So the elements of the communion are symbols of the covenant we have entered into with Christ, which he made possible by his sacrificial death on the cross. The elements, think about this, the elements recall what Christ had to do and what he did to make a relationship of love with him possible. The nature of our rebellion and its cost meant that he had to give up his body and lifeblood to death to make a restoration with God possible. Someone had to bear the consequences of our sin, and someone had to win back the life we had lost in our sin. So in his loving obedience to the Father's saving will by the power of the Spirit, Christ stepped in to pay for our sin and win the life for us that we had lost. And I'll direct you this to read it later. You remember these words from 1 Peter then, right? To reflect on the blood of Christ, to reflect on what we're talking about here in the communion. This is what Peter says. Since you call on a father, this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know, why? Why should we live out in reverent fear? Why should we live out in a deep trust of God? And in the people that, Paul, that Peter's writing to here, they're losing their lives for faithfulness to Jesus. They're losing their social networks and their families, and they're under pressure by the government for believing in Jesus. Well, why would they hold on to him? Why would they trust him? Why would they take the shame of Christ on them? Why would they go through suffering when all they had to do was reject Christ? Why would they live in fear of him? Why? For you know that it's not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Right? So these symbols are tokens of the covenant that we have entered into by faith with Christ. And so this is why Christ, another passage you want to reflect on as you think about the communion, is John chapter 10, right? Jesus, the great shepherd, the good shepherd. What did he say? I'm a good shepherd because I have laid down my life for my sheep. Okay. So, just like the ring, the ring doesn't marry the couple, but indicates that a marriage has taken place, I want to make it clear that as we take the elements of the communion, they do not create a relationship with Jesus. Okay, you, when you come here and you take the communion, sometimes you can get from different traditions as if you can come in no matter where you are in life, no matter your attitude toward God or everything else, and you take those elements and something spiritual happens to you because those elements some, do something to you, right? Well, if you went out today and you're not married, or when I, when I was 23 and I wasn't married, and I said, I'm just tired of people viewing me single, and I went out, I'm just going to buy a marriage ring, right? So I can do that. Well, I could pull off the fake for a little while, but that didn't make me married just because I had a ring on. 
Right? The ring doesn't make me a married person, right? You taking the elements today doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you a follower of Jesus. It doesn't make you a better follower of Jesus by doing so, okay? So they don't serve you magically to transform you or protect you, right? I say it to my own, many times as a young person coming up, I sit in here in this room bored with what's happening. I know I said it to you before, sitting in here in a large congregation just saying, can, we, can the ushers please hurry up, right? Can they please get those elements out a little bit further? And then those uncomfortable moments when somebody's asking me to bow my head and look into my own heart, and I'm want, my heart's wandering everywhere, and I'm going all this kind of things like that, and I don't want to mess with God in that moment, and I'm impatient with that moment. I was not engaging in that moment in any way that was indicative of a relationship with Jesus. Just like many times I wear this ring and I live toward Rana that makes a lie out of the vows that I've given to her. Because I don't treat her kindly. I don't respect her in the way I need to. I'm not concerned about her in the way I should. I'm not praying for her. I'm selfish. All those kind of, so by taking the elements, it doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't do something magical to you. It's not like a little spell you cast over yourself and say, okay, now I've taken the communion. Now I'm good with God and I'm protected from the evil one for a week. No, none of that happens. Right? So what happens? When you take the communion, it represents, and here's some, some blanks for you to fill in. What does it represent? It represents what has already occurred by faith between the one who takes communion, right? It, it, and and what, what happened between you and Jesus when you believed on him? That's what it represents. It represents what's already happened. And then second, it represents that you are joyfully giving thanks for the privileges that you have in Christ. Right? It's drawing you back into. And you know, this is the covenant, right? Ron and I have this mutual covenant. Well, when I came into this relationship with Jesus, he gave all the benefits. I just brought all the crap. I didn't contribute anything to it. Right? So hopefully, I think Rana would say, at least in some measure, that I brought something positive to our relationship. I know she brought many positive things to our relationship, but also I brought all my junk in there too. But when it came to Jesus and me, he brought all the good things. He restored me, recreated me, made me new, endowed me with everything that I need for a life of joy and faithfulness and obedience, and he promised to bring to fruition everything that he's promised me. What did I bring to him? A broken rebel who didn't deserve any of his compassion. And he says, I'll put these clothes on you uh, like the prodigal son. I'll give you a ring on your finger. I'll put the clothes on you. I'll call you my son. I'll give you all the privileges of my household, and you're my child. That's what he gave me. So those are the privileges. So Paul can start Ephesians with this praise, a praise psalm, and say, God in Christ has given you all of his riches. Right? And I know I mentioned this to you before, but the problem with most of us as Christians we don't need one more thing from God. What we desperately need is a deeper appreciation of what we already have. We don't need one more thing. If we have the cross and the promise of Christ's resurrection and everything, we have everything. That's why Paul would say to the, the Corinthians when he's writing in 1 Corinthians 2, not many of you are wise, not many of you are noble, not many of you are rich, but let me tell you really what you are rich in. Because if you know Christ, heaven and hell are yours. Life and death are yours, things present and things to come. Why? Because you're more than conquerors through Christ who has redeemed you. You have truly nothing to fear and you have everything to gain in Jesus. And then finally, so it represents what has already occurred. It represents their joyful thanks for the privileges they have in Christ. And it represents their joyful acceptance of every responsibility they have to Christ. Right? So this ring... Right? The privileges I have of Rana's loving care and her attention toward me, of the fact that she's my friend and partner, I have those privileges, but every day I have responsibilities toward her, to love her, to represent Christ to her as a Christian husband. I have those responsibilities. So, we come to the end of here. I mentioned to you when I, I perform weddings, it always makes me think about my own marriage. Right? Right? Guys, sometimes we, we don't like weddings, right? Not, those are not our favorite things to go to. Um, and and I, do, I do think in, sometimes in our culture, uh, it's become so about the woman that it really is not any more, ref, it's not as reflective as it needs to be. It's just a mutual covenant that's being entered into 
that both of the people need to be vested in that moment completely. So I think, I think it's one of those things where uh, we don't like to reflect on it, but every time I perform a marriage and every time I think about it, it makes me reflect on my life as a husband. It reminds me of Rana's love and commitment to me, but it also reminds me of the commitment I made to her. But there's many times when even though this ring has been on my finger, it's gone unnoticed. I've gotten bored with my commitment. I've gotten lax in my appreciation of Okay, you know you, I know me. Okay? For every friend I have in my life who truly knows me, for my wife, for my family, they know all the dark and sad stuff in my life. And you know yourself, you can't buy love, you can't force it, you can't manipulate it, it's just a gift. When Ryan's up here talking about one of his daughters just praying for him unprompted, right? Ryan is a dad. He could script that for her. Here, honey, here's a prayer for you to pray for your dad. All right? And we all know, okay, well, he's maybe trying to model something and teaching her. But when you have an expression that comes from the heart of somebody that you love and you recognize that they have gifted you with their affection, with their time, with their concern, with their life, with their energies that you have come... That's something you can't buy. You can't coerce. When I'm a good husband, I think of the fact that my wife said she would have me. Because I know me. Right? She said she would have me. She said she would hold me. She said she would walk with me. When I think of that, it swells in my heart and I say, I need to be a kind of person who loves her in return. Sometimes, though, it just becomes like the wallpaper in your house or like the verses we all put up on our walls that at one time they were meaningful to us and now we don't even recognize they're there until somebody comes in from outside our family and says, I love that verse and you have to look around because you don't know what it was. Right? So this ring can go unnoticed, but I want you to hear, what does the communion say to you from Jesus today? Just a couple of things. There's so many things here. And we're in this moment. I don't know about you, but life is just weighty. It's a grind. Right now, everything is difficult. Masks, you know, you open the news and it's just like somebody's ringing the alarm bell every day, right? Ding, 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 ding. We're all, after a while, when you're under alarm all the time, you just want to say, I'm just going to lay down here and die and let the fire trucks run over me, right? Just ding, ding, ding all the time. Everybody's scrambling there. Things are fighting. People are, are, are uh, things that are going, happening in the streets and the pressure of that just grinds down on people's souls. And it's not surprising that you can see all these clips where people just blow up on each other. Somebody walks into a Walmart and they're asked to put on a, you know, a, a, a mask and, and they just go off on the person and scream and throw stuff and, or vice versa, right? Kind of things that happen. Well, people are just boiling underneath there and it's boiling up in homes as domestic violence goes up. Suicide rates among young men are are going up and up and up and up, right? The after effects of the COVID shutdowns are affecting almost as many people as are affected by the COVID itself. And some of I don't know if you feel it, just the the hardness of going out, the the fact you want to retreat and everything, the fact you have to think about, as I talk to a person every time, I got to think about this kind of thing. It just grinds on you. But right here in the communion, when we face difficulties and tragedies, we wonder if Christ is really, has he really made us his own? I don't feel loved right now, Jesus. The communion comes back and reminds us, not only does Christ love you, but it reminds you of the depth of his love. Anytime when you doubt the goodness of God, you just need to go back and sit at the cross. That's what we're doing at the communion. We're all collectively holding hands and we're going to walk up here and we're just going to sit down right at the foot of the cross and we're going to say, does Jesus love us? We're going to say, yes. Yes. Yes, he does. To the nth degree. Right? Are you abandoned? No. So the second, so the first one, when we feel, face difficulties and tragedies, maybe we wonder if Christ really made us his own. The answer is yes, he did. Okay, the second one, when we feel abandoned and alone in our struggles, right? Some of us are blessed to have partners to walk through, or at least people in our homes to walk through that actually make this moment easier. But some of us in here 
are with groups of people or we're by ourselves where this time is especially difficult. It exacerbates our feeling of being abandoned or alone. God help us as a body to be aware of each other and try to go after it. But when we feel abandoned or alone in our struggles, we may wonder if Christ is with us. And this communion says, yes, he is with us. He gave us this token for us to keep coming back to, to say, I am with you, right? I'm with you. And then thirdly, when we get worn down by the impact of our own sin and the sin of others, right? This is where I I just feel ground, right? I'm worried because, right, if you've struggled with addictions, In the moment like this, when you get ground down, you can't just carry pressure forever. You're going to find some way to get it relieved. People just can't carry it forever. You're going to collapse either emotionally under it, you're going to run to drugs, maybe to old habits that you had before. Men are going to run back to pornography where they where they get find relief from it. You may, you may, you may actually become just a news junkie to try to get inside of it, and so you forget your commitment to Christ and the other things that mattered, but you're If anybody asks you any stats about COVID, you can quote everything, right? Because you're trying to manage your fear. And so in this moment, right, we feel abandoned or alone, right? We need to, uh, uh, we're worn down by the impact of our sin or those around us. We can lose hope and we can get off track. Communion assures us of Christ's loving commitment to us, right? The final words that we say in the communion, and we will, we proclaim the Lord's death, what? Until he comes until he comes right so is is christ for you as he made you yes that's what the communion says is he with you yes is he done is are these trials and things going to crush you are they going to win are they going to overcome you are they going to rob you of your potential can they really crush you the answer is no no he's coming he's coming right And and this moment is his token. And why does he give us the bread and the blood? Why? Because it takes us back to the death of Christ, to the giving of himself, his lifeblood for us. So the token of of the sincerity of his vows, and so then he asks us, right? What are we saying to Jesus as we take the elements? What have our lives been saying this week? So let's take them with thanksgiving. Let's renew our commitment to him with joy, right? And I got to read this passage because this is Paul, right? This is, this is the communion, right? For us, we need to hear these words of hope and promise and blessing and deep affection from Christ. You'll know them, right? In Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? Now, Paul's talking about all of the wonders of what God has done to bring about our redemption of a bunch of rebels who have thumbed their their noses at God, given him the finger, walked away from him. What what do we say to a God who who stepped in in great mercy and redeemed us at, at cost to himself, right? Brought us to himself when we were undeserving. What do we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? The God that is, has rescued you in Christ, nothing that's happening right now or threatening any of his promises. Everything. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. Right? God's, God's the judge and Christ is our defense attorney. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Right? And I want to put in right there that you can't separate yourself from the love of Christ. He'll sustain your faith and your faithlessness. He'll sustain you in your despair. He'll sustain you in your stupidity. He'll sustain you. He will pursue you as a son and daughter because he loves you too much to let you walk off on your own. And so this token of the sincerity of these vows that we're taking here is also a call that Jesus says, come back to me. Walk in the path of love and favor that I've laid out for you. 
Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword is written, for your sake we do face death all day long. We are condemned as sheep to be slaughtered. We do face the difficulties of a fallen world. We do experience the effects of our own sin and stupidity. We do expect the Uh, have the effects of sin that come to us from people who lash out at us, who reject us, who abandon us, who just have a bad day and crap all over us. We do expect that. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, neither COVID nor riots nor any powers, right? Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We need to hold on to that hope and live into that hope for the people in our lives. And our witness begins with our husbands and wives and with our kids in the home. Pray with me, will you? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Jesus, you knew, Lord, over the, this moment in time, which is the time of your patience, Lord, you You tell us, why do you tarry? Why do you wait? Because you're a God who's long-suffering and willing that all would come to repentance. And Lord, so you ask us as your people to have your heart for the world in which we live. And Lord, out of a gratefulness that you have rescued us and you have brought us to yourself, and Lord, that you have unleashed us back into the world to proclaim the fact that real life, freedom, hope, purpose, meaning is found in Jesus. And Lord, you tarry. Lord, and all around the world, Lord, Christians are struggling today, many of them in places that are much more oppressive and difficult than we have ever known. And Lord, we pray that you would help us as your people to receive these tokens today of your vows and your commitment to us, to remind us of the reality of your love, to remind us of its permanence, to remind us of its depth. Lord, please, Lord, do a work in us to awaken us to what you have done to us in such a way that as Paul would pray in 2 Corinthians 5, that we would become constrained, Lord, that our hearts and minds, our habits, our mouths, our, our, our pocketbooks, Lord, our choices in life would be constrained by wanting to, to love you with everything that we are and do. Lord, help us, Lord. We are weak. We are forgetful. We take for granted Lord, thank you that you're patient and kind. So I pray for my brothers and sisters for their blessing today and pray in the name of Christ. Amen. So right now, if you want to take out the elements that were provided or if you're at home, hopefully you've gathered some elements there with you so that you can join in with us as the body of Christ. And because we do this, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, it's not only indicative when I take these elements that I personally have believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that's why I want to encourage you, if you're here with us today and you don't know Christ as Savior, we, we yearn for you to know Him. We yearn for you to know Him. But I don't want to encourage you to take these elements if you don't know Christ. They don't do anything for you. They don't accomplish anything. They're meant to indicate what's happened between you and Jesus already. So if you know Jesus Christ is telling something about your own commitment to Christ, you're receiving these tokens of Jesus' vows and commitment to you, but also you're being reminded of your responsibilities to Christ in return, uh, the responsibilities, these privileges you have to serve Him, to know Him, right? So as you do, and the reason why we take it together, as we read in 1 Corinthians 10, we're all one people in a real profound, deep spiritual way because we've all partaken of the one loaf. We've all been united in Christ. And it doesn't make any difference if you're rich or poor, black or white, or whoever you are. We are one in Jesus Christ, and that makes us a new people, not just new creations, but new people. We're His. And He calls us to be one people in Him. And so we indicate that. We'll open it together. We'll take it together. We'll do everything together here this morning. So if you want to take that first one, right, in this uh, unusual moment and pull back your first layer... And I've already messed mine up and taken two layers. So no use hiding it here as I fumble around here. I was reflecting uh, how odd it sounds in this moment. I remember when I got to Scotland and the first church that I joined and became a part of 
uh, on Sunday evenings, we took the communion with a common chalice. I thought, uh, that wouldn't fly very well this morning, all right, in terms of that. Here's what Paul relays to us in terms of what Jesus instituted. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray in the name of Christ, Lord, please, by your Spirit, Transform us, do a work in us, Lord, that stirs us up to enter into the reality of what you've done for us afresh and anew. Lord, stir up our deadened souls. Lord, plow up hardened ground. Lord, move us to tears and elation as we remember what you've done. Thank you, Lord, for giving up yourself for us. In the name of Christ. And then Jesus continued in the same way after supper. He took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the music team comes up, pray with me, will you? I just want to encourage you that this is, this is not Jesus coming. One thing that's helped me so often, I don't know if you, one of the sweet memories in my life and one of the things that's been so, uh, a sweet memory is, is somebody calling you to the table, somebody preparing a meal and saying, okay, everybody come eat, right? And when somebody invites you to the table, they're coming, they're coming to bless you. They're coming to feed you, to, to say that I love you, and I want to sit with you. I want to enjoy fellowship with you. I don't know if you think Jesus says, come on, come on, my people, my children, come eat, right? And because he loves us, when he says, come eat, right? If you grew up like I did, my mom would often turn to me and say, Greg, did you wash your hands, right? And I had to go wash my hands, and I usually did it really fast and really poorly because I wanted to eat whatever's on the table, Right? So Jesus calls us to the table to help us get cleaned up and then to tell us, I just want to remind you of my love for you, so I want to empower you for life and service. Right? The impact of the communion shouldn't make you walk away guilty. It should make you walk away feeling loved, forgiven, blessed. You should walk away with hope, purpose, that he can take the crappy stuff that you did, he just wash it up. Say, you're mine, I love you. Come on, come eat today. God help us to take these tokens and be blessed by what Christ has done for us.